I, I, was, I was umming and ahhing about speaking on intercession this evening and the role of the Spirit in prayer, and um, I, we might save that for another time. I, I do want to talk about the Spirit in prayer, but um, just in a slightly more, I, th I think, a slightly more focused way. And um, the place I want to start is by talking, some of you may have come across a guy who's a, 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 quite a well-known journalist back in the day called Malcolm Muggeridge. And his story is that he became a Christian later on in life, and uh, he wrote about um, kind of his journey to faith, really. And one of the things that he said was significant for him when was in, in terms of him coming to know Jesus was something that happened to him when he was a younger, a younger man. Um, I can't remember exactly how old he was, but I think he was in his 20s. And he ended up going as a journalist to India. He was covering uh, for a particular newspaper out there in India. And he wasn't, at this point, a follower of Jesus. And he he'd always had something of a fantasy of having an affair. He was married, and he'd always had this kind of idea that one day he'd like to, if he could, when he was traveling, maybe have an affair without his wife ever finding out. And there was this particular occasion that he describes in one of his books where he, he was uh, on, the, on the banks of the Ganges River really early one morning, and it was very foggy. Um, uh, the sun was just beginning to come up, and uh, he saw through the, kind of, through the fog this, this woman um, getting into the water, uh, getting in for a swim, and she was naked. And so um, he thought, this is my opportunity to fulfill my fantasy, to have an affair. So he, he, he got into the water, and he began to swim towards her. And he was kind of thinking, well, I'm, I'm a rich, wealthy Westerner. Um, uh, she's not going to refuse my advances. And so he, he, as he got closer and closer, he, um, he suddenly, when he was close enough, she suddenly was very startled, this lady, and she, she, she freaked out a bit because she realized that, number one, um, uh, she wasn't the only person in the water, and secondly, the other guy was this, was this Westerner. And, um, and then he, he got close enough to see her, and he realized that she was shocked, not just because he was a, a Western man in the water at that time, but also because she was a leper. And um, in... In that culture, uh, you wouldn't go near someone who had leprosy. And he came close enough to see her, and he saw that the disease had disfigured her in all sorts of horrific ways. And he said at that moment, when, when he was kind of there naked in the water with this woman who had leprosy, he said, I suddenly saw like a window, as it were, into my own soul. And I realized that however disfigured she might be because of her illness, it was nothing in the comparison uh, it was nothing in comparison to the ugliness of my soul in that moment. And it was as if, as if he suddenly had a revelation of his own sin and his own brokenness. And uh, I don't know what your story is of coming to know Jesus, but my story starts with thinking that I was doing God a favor by following him. And, you know, I, I weighed up the evidence. And I thought, okay, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, and here's my life, and isn't it good? And, um, and then as I started to follow the Lord, I became increasingly aware, um, maybe not in the moment that Malcolm Muggeridge had it, but over time of my own sin and my own brokenness and the ugliness of my own soul. And it has been, it's been quite a ride since then, and I'm still very much having occasionally just revelations of, of my, my own failures. Um, as much as I don't like to admit it, uh, you know, Mike was, was talking this afternoon, and um, I'll return the compliment. I genuinely thought it was a phenomenal talk. And one of the things that he was saying was about how in a culture of grace, in a church that really understands the concept and uh, the idea of grace, there's space for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is much more able to move when, when we understand that we simply receive and um, the Holy Spirit that Mike mentioned, the people who find it hardest sometimes to receive the Holy Spirit are those who think everything has to be earned. Hello. Um, that's me. That's, 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 that's what I'm like. And he referenced the older brother and how it's the younger son who comes and, and in the end, for all his wayward ways, he kind of, he comes home and he comes into the father's house and he's able to receive the love of the father. And it's the older brother at the end of the story who's kind of, you don't really know whether he comes in or not. He's left outside. Is he able to receive uh, or not? He's been slaving away all these years for something that was already his anyway, but he can't seem to get his head around that. Well, if the older brother had an older brother, it would be Andy Croft. I, I, I feel like I have everything that he seems to, seems to have, but like 10 times as much. And so the idea of coming to Jesus, um, first of all, it was, it, was, it was just, okay, this makes sense. And then gradually it was increasingly a sense of, gosh, uh, I, I can't do this. 
I can't do what you're asking me to do, Lord. You, I see here I'm meant to live like this and do such and such, and I can't do those things. And I found it incredibly hard along the way. And there have been various ways that it's manifested itself for me. One of them is a massive fear of failure that I have. Um, uh, for whatever reason, I've always felt like I needed to earn love. And so um, I have a bit of a connection between success and love, and, and I feel like um, it's not a rational thing, but it's just something that that's there. If I'm successful, people will love me, and if I'm not, then they won't. And although I know that's not rational, there's very little I can do about it. Even now, as I, as I, as I give these talks, even here, it's like, oh man, if I, give you, if I give you a good talk, then maybe you'll like me. And if I don't, maybe you won't. And, and that's, that's a real fear. And so there have been plenty of times over the years where uh, uh, I've had something of a meltdown, um, I mean, one occasion was at Momentum, I don't know, a few years ago, where I gave a talk, it didn't go very well. Uh, I, I remember going back to the room where Mike and I prepare, and Mike was there, and I was just a mess, and I was just so frustrated and cut up about the fact that the talk didn't go as well as I hoped. And I just started crying, and I just was saying, I can't do this, I just don't think I can do this. And um, Mike freaked out and um, stood in the corner, not knowing what to do, and kept saying, what have I done to you? What have I done to you? <laughs> and I better call Beth. Let me call Beth. Like, and, and, uh, and, and then I, I remember saying to him, and I, it's humiliating for me to admit this to you, but I remember him, uh, I kind of just sort of like drying my eyes, like, I don't know, I was in a film or something, and then saying, don't worry, Mike, I will rise like this, like a phoenix from the ashes. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't joking, like that's how, that's how sad I am. And, 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 Mike, and then Mike just said, all right, okay. And then he said, but, but Andy, it's, ultimately it's not really about you, is it? At that point I started crying all over again because I realized <laughs> I'd also made it all about me. And um, you know, there are other occasions when I finished university, I came and got the, started working you know, for Soul Survivor and, and um, I thought, right, this is it. I'm working on full-time ministry now. I better be serious about my prayer life. I've got to be you know, really going for it. So I started to get up at five in the morning to try and pray. That's just, um, I, 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 everything I do, I do on the basis of willpower. So like, right, set an alarm, 5 a.m., get up at 5 a.m. And I did it for like four days. And, and it meant that by the time it got to 10 o'clock in the morning, I was just so dead. But I got up at five and I remember Mike and I were in the gym and uh, we, were, um, uh, we were just chatting, and I just casually dropped in, you know, as you do when, you, when, you, when you're su successful at prayer for a few weeks. I just casually dropped in. Oh, by the way, you know, I got up at 5 o'clock this morning. I was praying and interceding. And, um, uh, and he, just, he just said it so kindly, but he just said to me, um, are you, Andy, you know, what are you trying to prove? At which point I started crying. <laughs> <laughs> It's not normal for me to do that, I have to tell you. And in the gym, it was a little bit embarrassing. Um, but I just, again, what, what hit me was, gosh, here I am again, trying to, trying to earn it, trying to prove myself, trying to, trying to, I'm trying to strive for something that, that, that the gospel tells me is given to me for free. Gosh. And um, the reason I'm saying this and the reason this connects to the Holy Spirit is because there has been... Uh, nothing has helped me more than the Holy Spirit in coming to understand the depth of the love that God has for me. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, that the Spirit is the love of God poured into our hearts. And so it's like God's love which is displayed on the cross for all of us to see. Uh, the event that happened 2,000 years ago was what won our salvation. But it's the Holy Spirit who makes it real for us in our hearts. The Spirit is like a wave poured out you know, from the sea, and it's like God's love is poured out. And then what the wave does is it sucks all the pebbles on the beach back in, into the ocean. And it's like God pours the Spirit out into our hearts that we might be drawn back into Him. And that's one of the reasons why the first manifestation of the Holy Spirit is actually not seeing people healed uh, or, or having prophetic words. It's loving Jesus more. It's understanding and knowing His love more. It says um, elsewhere in Romans that it's the Spirit who helps us understand that we're, we're not slaves to fear, which is too often uh, where I live from, but we are actually sons and daughters of God, and therefore what we do is, is by the Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit is the Spirit of adoption. And think about it, if I was to say to you, you know, um, let's say you've never known your dad, and you were to come in here, and I was to say, hey, you see that guy over there? It turns out that's your dad. 
uh, and I've got the adoption papers here to prove it, have a little look, and you were to see them, and you were to see that they were legitimate, but you were to look at this guy, this strange bloke over there, you, you would feel no love for that person, even if in theory you were convinced that that was actually technically your dad. Something else needs to happen, there needs to be something going on inside, and that's what the Spirit does. And this crushing pressure that I have felt, and I still at times feel, um, it's only the Holy Spirit that relieves the pressure. And it's only practicing and um, experiencing and depending on the Spirit that has enabled me to uh, step out as a follower of Jesus, take risks as a follower of Jesus, but even more than that, more fundamentally than that, is, is just love him and be loved by him. And one of the ways that I, 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 I describe it sometimes is it's like, um, uh, you know, if you see a car crash or something, sometimes what they do, because the cars are so heavy, is they bring in this equipment. It's like, um, uh, it's like, it's like an inflate. It's a bit like a bouncy castle. It's like, they, it's like a giant mattress or something. What they do is they put it under a particular car, and they'll press a button, and it just pumps this thing full of air. And so there might be someone underneath it, but this, this thing that's full of air lifts, because of the air pressure, it lifts the weight off whoever it's crushing. And um, that's, that's what I think the Spirit has done for me, is that he's... he's just like the wind, the breath of God, blown in and lifted off all these pressures that somehow crush me. And sometimes they come back, but then the Spirit again lifts it off. And that might sound like a, a, a nice little theory. And so what I wanted to do is tie it down particularly to um, one thing, one way, one gift of the Spirit um, that I have found to be an incredibly useful gift and that I think um, is a way for all of us, maybe whatever our version of, of the ugliness of our soul is, it's a way of our growing and being refined and being made more into the likeness of God. And it's the gift of tongues and praying in the gift of tongues. And if you already have that gift, uh, then I hope there'll still be something in here that would encourage you um, to use it. And if you don't, then um, wait and see what happens. But the gift of tongues is where I want to go. And um, if you want to, you, you don't have to follow along in your Bible, but basically uh, the, the first kind of instance that we see of the gift of tongues is on the day of Pentecost. And so uh, there's a real connection between being filled with the Spirit and praying in tongues. You see that uh, on the day of Pentecost, the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter, chapter 2, verse 4, it says, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And that's closely associated all the way through the book of Acts. So later on in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius and the Gentiles are also filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, it says in verse 45 of chapter 10, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then there's another instance where Paul uh, comes across some uh, believers in, in Ephesus, but they haven't, they haven't even heard that there's a Holy Spirit before. And so he kind of introduces them to the Holy Spirit and to Jesus, and he places his hands on them in verse 6 of chapter 19. He placed his hands on them, and then the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And so there's a real strong connection between being filled with the Spirit and praying in tongues. Now, that doesn't mean to say that if you don't pray in tongues, you're not filled with the Spirit. I don't think the Scripture teaches that at all. But there is a connection there. And one of the things I think it implies is that those of us who are filled with the Spirit, which is any of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, uh, all of us, this is something that's available for all of us because it's, just a, it's, a, it's a gift that comes from the Spirit who's already living inside of us. And the other main place where you see uh, discussion of tongues in the New Testament comes in 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 12 and chapters 14. And uh, if you were to maybe take away and, and later on read through 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it's a fascinating chapter. But if you were to read it initially, one of the things that you might see or, or, or think is that Paul's being negative about the gift of tongues. But that's actually not what's going on when you dig into the context. And the context is... In, in the um, New Testament, there seem to be three manifestations of this gift, the gift of tongues. The first one is called xenoglossolalia by the theologians. And what that just means is you learn to speak in a foreign language, like an actual foreign language. So it might be on the day of Pentecost, they come out and they're actually speaking a foreign language that the foreigners who are around could, could understand. That's one manifestation. The second manifestation is where somebody says something in a tongue and an interpretation is needed. So neither they nor the person, uh, nor the pe people who are listening understand what they've said, and so somebody needs to interpret it in order for people to understand. And that's something that happens in a public setting. 
And then the third manifestation is the private personal use of tongues, where people pray in a language that they don't know, and they don't really know what they're praying, but they're doing it in a personal context. What Paul is doing when he's writing to the Corinthians is he's, he's kind of telling them off because they're misusing manifestation number two. In other words, what they were doing is they were having meetings like this, and then people were getting out and they were giving long speeches in the gift of tongues that neither they nor anybody else in the room understood, and then they were sitting down again. And they were doing that time and time and time again. I don't know if you can imagine bringing a friend to church, and uh, you know the guy gets up and says something that he doesn't understand and nobody else understands, and then two or three other people do the same thing. Well, that's what the Corinthians were doing, and Paul was just saying, don't do that. And so when you read it, it can seem like he's saying, don't do that, do other things. But actually what he's saying is, no, the gift of tongues is valuable, it's precious, and, and you just need to use it correctly. And the thing that you really get, if we, if we look at 1 Corinthians 14, one of the things that really becomes clear is that for Paul, this is a precious gift. And so actually when you dig into it, you see that one of the things he says is, and this is from um, verse 18 and 19, he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. And there he's referring to his personal devotion, his, his own personal prayer life, because he goes on to say, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words. In other words, when I'm in the church, people need to understand what I'm saying, otherwise nobody else gets blessed and it's just self-indulgent and selfish. But in my own prayer life, this is what I do more than anyone else. And he go, he, elsewhere, he says, what, what, um, this is 1 Corinthians 14, 14, anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves. And that's one of the things that's unique about the gift of tongues. It builds you up. It, it strengthens us. Um, because Mike and I go to the gym, one of the things that I've been trying to do in recent years is bulk up. I'm trying to compete with him, and I've got a long way to go. But in order to help with that, I, um, I, I, I drink protein powder. So I don't know if any of you guys drink protein powder. Maxi Muscle Cyclone is my drink of choice. But um, I'll go to the gym, and what I'll do is I'll just do my exercises, but then I'll drink this protein because I know that if I drink the protein, it will help build me. It's like, you know, you do the exercise, but then this, this, this special magic powder somehow helps proteins and muscles form in my body. I obviously need to be drinking a little bit more of it. But it's, it's, that's, what, that's what the Spirit does in a sense. It's like, it's like He helps build our spiritual muscle. He builds our soul up. Think again of that kind of that mattress filling with air it's like it's like the spirit of god he, he he grows us he strengthens us he fills us with life and when we pray in the spirit when we pray with this gift of tongues it's like we are having a spiritual workout it strengthens us and one of the one of the images that i have of, of and again this is a personal thing for me of my own story is i see myself very much in the story of the good samaritan not actually as the good samaritan or the other two guys that walk past but as the guy that's lying on the road who's just had his head kicked in and I feel like that's that's a little bit me it's like I've had my head kicked in by because of stupid things I've done I've had my head kicked in by things other people have done and it's like Jesus as the good Samaritan comes along and what he does is he picks me up and he he, he binds up my wounds and he begins to bring healing at his own expense to my heart and to my life and he puts a balm on all of the things that that, that are poison in my soul and the balm is the balm of the spirit and there's something about, and I can't give you a mathematical formula for it, but there's something about praying in tongues that it's almost like it opens us up to his work, to the work of the Spirit. It's almost like, in a way, it, it, it's our placing ourselves, if, if you like, on the hospital bed, and it's just saying, meet me, heal me, restore me, do things in my life, change me, sort me out. Um, one of the reasons it's so powerful is because it, it bypasses sometimes some of our rational ways of approaching things. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 14 and 15, he says this, If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. And so, of course, we're to pray with our minds. Of course, we're to use our reason. Uh, that, too, is a God-given faculty, and we're told to love God with all of our minds. But there's also such a value in learning to pray in the Spirit. And as someone who has, to a disproportionate and dysfunctional extent, operated out of his head, I can tell you there are a few things that I have found more restorative than learning to pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's a few ways in which praying in the gift of tongues can be a blessing. The first one uh, is it gives words for the soul. And um, 
think about it like this. I don't know if you've ever been in love, but there are times when, when you're in love where you, you just don't have the words to say. I remember being really nervous about my wedding speech, even though when you're the groom, really all you've got to do is say, thanks very much. Uh, and everyone's just going to cheer anyway. But I remember being so nervous, and I was like, what is wrong with me? I, says, well, I, I give talks all the time. Why am I so nervous about this one? And I think it's just because I thought, I'm only ever going to do this once, and I want to get it right, and I want to try and find the words that are going to be appropriate. So finding words sometimes when you're in love is difficult. Mike mentioned that um, sometimes we go to the Sahara Lounge in um, Stanmore. Well, I've never seen him more lost for words than when he's got a kebab at the Sahara Lounge. It's like suddenly the guy that can preach for an hour and a half without realizing it can't find the words to articulate how good the chicken is that's been marinating for three days. And so it may be different for you, but there are times when all of us find ourselves, so, you know, you want to you say, oh my word, this is amazing. But like, after you've said amazing 15 times, it's like, what else do you say? And there's something about the gift of tongues that it's almost like it gives our soul a voice to articulate what's really going on inside. I find that sometimes with the best worship songs, you know, it's like you're singing it and someone else wrote the words, but suddenly it's you're like, yes, this is it. This is where I'm at. It's, it's helping me articulate what I know I feel inside. Well, the gift of tongues is like that. It helps us to articulate something that we know goes on inside. And so when they're filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost and they begin to speak in tongues, well, guess what they're talking about? They burst out of the room and they're praising God and they're speaking of the wonders of God. That's what it is. One of the images I sometimes have of it is it's like a, I know this is a terrible image to use of the Holy Spirit, but it's like, it's like a keg of beer, you know, and you, you, you want to, you, you tap it, you put the little kind of, th the, the tap in there and suddenly this stuff just comes gushing out. And sometimes it's like our minds, it, it's, it's not that we pray without our minds, but our minds are not necessary sometimes in expressing how we're feeling. It's almost like God taps into our souls almost through the gift of tongues and suddenly what's in here just pours straight out. It pours directly out to him. So it gives us words for praise it provides words for the soul, and not just for praise, but also for prayer. And there are many, many times, you must have experienced this, where you're lost, where you're trying to pray, and you just like, I don't know what to say. Whether it's thanks, or, it, or it's, it's, it's pain. Whether it's you prayed for the same person for weeks and weeks, or months or years, and you just haven't got any other words to say, you know, can you make them a Christian, Jesus? Or like, you haven't got anything else to say. Sometimes the Spirit gives us words in those instances. And this is what Paul's talking about when he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, he says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. You hear that? He helps. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now that is a massive verse that in my experience, uh, I think I'm only just beginning to, 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 to kind of tap into everything that is said in there. It's not just about praying in tongues. There's something richer and deeper and more profound um, and that's, that is currently beyond uh, what I've experienced in my own heart and my own life. But there's something in there, isn't there, that I think we all can begin to grasp, which is this idea that the Spirit prays for us, but he prays for us from inside of us. It's like, it's like you have this image in the Trinity, two of the members of the Trinity. Did you know this? Two of the members of the Trinity are currently praying for us right now. The first one is Jesus, who sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven and we're told is praying for us right now. And the second one is the Holy Spirit, who lives inside of us and prays through us. And it says here that God knows the mind of the Spirit. And so when we don't know the words to pray, to pray in the Spirit is like is what we need because God, the Spirit always knows what to pray and the Father listens to the Holy Spirit. And so praying in tongues is one way that we practice that praying in the Spirit. And so some, th some of the things that I find helpful sometimes when I'm praying for, like for example, my brother who isn't a follower of Jesus and who I'm just wanting to become a Christian and I have been for years, I've run out of words. Like, I don't know what else to say. So I just, I just name him and then I'll pray for him and I'll use the gift of tongues to do that. And I find that very helpful. So the Spirit gives... Words for the soul. Secondly, um, the Spirit helps us to draw near. And prayer isn't just about, um, it can feel sometimes kind of like going through the motions, but at its best, what it's meant to be is, is coming into drawing near to his presence. And it's being in the throne room almost of, of, of God Almighty. And the, the Spirit's how, how we get there. 
So we can sit in our cars on a motorway, or we can, you know, just be on the tube, or we can sit in our room at home, and, and it's through the Spirit that we come into this, this understanding and this love and this presence of God. And so in Jude, Mike quoted it earlier, Jude chapter 20, it says, and praying in the Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love. There's something about the Spirit that keeps us in the love of God. Occasionally, uh, Mike and I do crazy things, and one of the things that we did, I remember it a few years ago now, is um, we drove, Mike was speaking at Shepton Mallet, New Wine, I think it was, and we drove down, I went around to, to hang around with him, and we drove down together, and it's about a two and a half hour drive from, from Watford to Shepton Mallet, and we decided we would just pray in tongues all the way. Um, so we, we, we set off from Watford, and that's all we did. We just prayed in tongues all the way, and by the time we arrived in Shepton Manor, we were ready to take off. Uh, I mean, it was, it was, I can't really, it was amazing. Like, it's just the sense of the glory of God, the sense of the presence of God. We were, at various points, we were laughing our heads off about, I don't really know what, maybe it's just the situation, but there was something about also the joy of the Spirit that was, that was there. It was, it was a wonderful thing, and it was just using the gift of tongues. And what happens is, and again, I can't give you a formula for it, but as we do that, this, there's a drawing near, and there's a coming into. If you remember that image of the Spirit being like a wave, He sucks us into the presence of the Lord. So, that's the second way in which the uh, gift of tongues can be beneficial. And the third way is that um, the Spirit and praying in tongues, I think, provides breakthrough, often in areas that we, we, we sometimes struggle to see uh, in praying in other ways. And again, I don't want to make this into a formula, but I'll just point you to um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, where Paul says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And I want to take that verse more seriously. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And the context of the verse is one of spiritual warfare. It's one where there's, there's something of a battle going on with the principalities and the powers. And actually what I've observed um, over time is that sometimes praying in the Spirit, it has an indirect, it builds us up. It seems to be that's the primary thing. But it also seems to have an indirect effect on other people and, and things that are going on around us. Um, there was a time when... Uh, uh, at Soul Survivor a little while ago, um, we were talking about the gift of tongues and we, we made space to pray for people to receive this gift. And there was a guy, um, unbeknown to uh, Mike and myself, there was a youth uh, group there from Romania. And there was a, the guy who was the youth leader didn't believe in the gift of tongues. And so uh, I think he, he managed to sit all the way through the talk. But then when we decided to actually pray for people to receive the gift, at that point he decided he had enough. And so he got up and he started to leave. Uh, he was walking out of the tent. And we found this out afterwards because his youth group told us and he later wrote a letter to us. But basically what happened is as he got up to leave, we were, you know, we were in the middle of sort of praying for people to receive the gift and we were, we were praying and sometimes we, we all begin to worship the Lord and we pray in our own tongues just to encourage people. And Mike happened to be praying in his tongue over the microphone and he was, he'll tell you that uh, as he was doing it, he thought, gosh, this is, this is different from the tongue that I normally pray and this sounds really different. And he subconsciously thought, am I just doing like, a, trying to do a more impressive tongue so I, so I sound better like to everybody else who's in the tent? I don't think I'm doing that. But anyway, um, and then we found out afterwards that this guy, this remaining guy who's leaving the tent, stopped dead in his tracks when he heard Mike praying in his tongue over the microphone. And the reason he stopped dead in his tracks is because he recognized what Mike was saying. And it turns out that he was speaking in ancient Romanian. Now, needless to say, Mike was unbelievably pleased with himself <laughs> when he found out that he knew ancient Romania, I can tell you. Um, don't, don't encourage him. Um, the reason this guy, this Romanian guy, knew ancient, this particular bit of ancient Romanian was actually, it gets even more bizarre, because they, the, it was, he was saying the words of an ancient Romanian poem that this guy's dad had tattooed on his back. And... Um, so you might imagine that this guy now believes in the gift of tongues. He had a turned around and he came back in. But sometimes when we pray in tongues, there, there can be an indirect effect on others, and there can be something of a breakthrough. Jackie Pullinger, if you've ever heard her story, you know, she, uh, the book Chasing the Dragon tells of how she went as a, as a kind of young lady by herself off to Hong Kong, and she ended up working with the triad gangs and drug addicts and stuff like that, and she was just not getting anywhere. They were so broken, they were so messed up, she couldn't see anything happen. And then finally, she decided that she would pray in tongues, and she said it didn't feel very spiritual. She literally set a clock, she set like a stopwatch, and she said, I'll pray in tongues for 15 minutes a day, and that's what she did. 
And she says, this is what she says in her book. By the clock I prayed 15 minutes a day in the language of the Spirit and still felt nothing as I asked the Spirit to help me intercede for those he wanted to reach. But then, after about six weeks of this, I began to lead people to Jesus without trying. Gangsters fell to their knees sobbing in the streets. Women were healed. Heroin addicts were miraculously set free. And I knew it was nothing to do with me. She would say it was everything to do with using this gift. So what the Spirit does is he supplies words for our soul and he draws us near. And I think also powerfully advances the kingdom of God when we use and exercise. Praying in the Spirit, and obviously that's not all praying in tongues, but praying in tongues can be a huge part of that. So how do we receive the gift of tongues if this is something um, that we haven't yet received? It's um, uh, reasonably straightforward. It is straightforward. The first thing is to believe that God wants to give us this gift, and he does. And um, there are many places we could turn, but I'll just very briefly read you some words from Luke um, chapter 11, starting, I'm going to read from verse uh, 9. So I say to you, this is Jesus, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your fa- which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And in a similar um, uh, kind of statement in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, it doesn't say the Holy Spirit, but it says good gifts. And so you put those two things together, and it's not the gifts of the Spirit is what God wants to give us. He wants to give us the Holy Spirit, but he also wants to give us the gifts of the Spirit. Paul says to the Corinthians, I want every one of you to pray in this gift. He doesn't say things like that to tease us, but because this is a gift that's available for all of us who want to seek it. And um, there was a guy uh, I heard tell, he was talking a little bit about his niece, who he, who he babysits for sometimes. And he says, this little girl, she's called Alice, and she's seven years old. And one of Alice's favorite games is the game hide and seek. And so he says, there was this one time he was babysitting for Alice, and she, she, she said, let's play hide and seek. And so he said, okay. And then he said, let's clarify the rules, because he's found that when you play games with little kids, if you don't clarify the rules beforehand, they tend to go against you. And so um, Alice said, okay, uncle, uh, this is what we'll do. You close your eyes and count to 10, and I am going to go and hide behind the kitchen door. <laughs> and he said, okay, sorry, say again. So she repeated it. So you're going to hide behind the kitchen. I'm going to close my eyes and count to 10. And then come and find me. Okay. So he closed one, two, three, and then Alice runs off. And then he goes into the kitchen. He says, now, where's Alice? And he hears this giggling from behind the kitchen door. Is Alice underneath the kitchen table? Peals of laughter from behind the kitchen door. No, she isn't. Is Alice hiding in the cupboard? Peals of laughter from behind the kitchen door. No, Alice isn't in the cupboard. Is Alice behind the kitchen door? Absolute hilarity from behind the kitchen door. And he pulls the door open there. Alice is collapsing on the floor. She's so, and then, and then she says, okay, okay, when she goes to cupboard, she says, all right, uncle, all right, uncle, this is what we're going to do. We're going to play again. Now, the rules are this time, you close your eyes and count to 10, and I'm going to go and hide under mummy and daddy's bed. And they play it all over again. And in that sense, God is a little like Alice, in so much as what he does is he says, look, we're going to play a, just a very, you know, we're going to play a little game of hide and seek, but what we're going to do is we're going to clarify the rules in advance. So, so if you seek me, you will find me. If you knock, I will open the door. If you ask, you will receive. And so the first place for us in receiving the gift is just being confident that our Father's not playing tricks on us, that he wants to give us the gift. The second thing is asking for it. And um, that's what Jesus says. He just says, how much more will the Holy Spirit give, uh, the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And just on that, I won't take long on it, but basically all it is, is it's simply saying to God, I want to receive this gift. Um, Sometimes there's persistence involved. It's not like ordering an app or a McDonald's or, you know, it, sometimes there's persistence, sometimes it doesn't happen straight away, but if we're persistent in our asking, he hears that. And then the third thing is we step out and we try. And um, uh, the gift of tongues always involves faith, just like all the other gifts does. I used to think before I received it that it was like a robot would come and take over your mouth, you know, and you'd kind of just start speaking this language without moving your lips. And uh, I realized that it doesn't really happen that way. 
And just to finish, I'll tell you a little bit about how I received the gift of tongues. Uh, I received it. Um, I, I heard Mike speak about it. I heard Mike's talk on it many times. And um, I decided this is something I want to do. But I, um, because I always operate from my head, I just couldn't understand how you would be able to start speaking in a language that you didn't, you didn't actually know. And so I, um, I tried s several occasions. It didn't happen. I thought, fine, I'm giving up. It's not, it's not going to happen. God doesn't want to give me this gift. And, um, and then there was a time we were in Australia, and Mike was speaking uh, in Melbourne, and there was, we were in this big tent, and I remember he spoke on the gift of tongues. He said, anyone who wants to receive this gift, come forward to receive it. So I went forward. I thought, I'll have another go. And then um, we, we, we prayed, and then Mike said, now, just, just start speaking. You know, you've asked. Now, just start praising God. Open your mouth and praise God. And I remember everybody else around me opened their mouths and praised God, and it seemed like praise them in the tongues of men and of angels, and it was, like, stunning. And I just went, wow. Um, and I remember, again, just feeling so frustrated. I can't speak in a language I do not know. I can't speak in a language I do not know. And I left the tent. I just walked out of the tent. And I, I went and sat under this tree. It was evening, and I sat under this tree by myself. And I, I just recall one of the things that Mike said, which was, if, if it feels like gobbledygook, he said when he received the gift, Lord, if this is gobbledygook, may it be gobbledygook for you. And so I thought, all right, I'll just say something. And nobody's here to hear me. And if it's gobbledygook, Lord Jesus, well, what the heck, may it be gobbledygook for you. And also, there's this thing that St. Anselm said about how, he said, I believe so that I may understand. And it's almost like you step out, and then you understand afterwards, but it involves the stepping out. And so I stepped out, and I want to make it sound more spiritual than it was, but it was literally like something dribbled over my lip. Um, I choked out some sort of weird phrase, and that was it. And then, and then I carried on saying gobbledygook for Jesus, and somewhere along the line, I don't know where it was, it became a language, and he breathed on it. And it grew, and a bit like learning your ABC, you start off with little phrases, and then something happens from that. And um, one of the reasons why I'm utterly convinced that it is the gift of tongues, and it isn't just me making it up, is because as I've prayed it, I've found words for my soul, and he's drawn me into him. And I have seen, and I continue to see, answers of prayer when I lift things up to him. And what's happened is, uh, as I see Jesus and I compare myself to him, I become more aware of the ugliness of my own soul than I think I have ever done. But I also become more aware of his grace and his beauty and the wonderful gift that is the Holy Spirit. And as I exercise the gift of tongues, it opens me up to the work of the Spirit, and I'm changed by that.